Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to Spark A Summit 2018. I'm super excited to have you here in my session. And today is a wonderful day for me. You know why? Wherever I see a bunch of people are talking about Spark, A, Cloud, Amazon, Redshift, those kind of technologies. And those are all the passionates to learn a new technology in, in the current arena. And uh, all right. Uh, so I'm here to talk about the, the de detecting of possible fraudulent uh, prescription claims and the possible actors behind them using Apache Spark. So before I start with, let me introduce myself. So my name is Gridhar and Gurumurthy. If you have any trouble to pronounce my name, you can call me Giri for simplicity. Uh, for the past 11 years, I have been working, uh, I have been associated with the healthcare industry and uh, in my ten uh, tenure, so I have been working with the multiple or different uh, kind of a data analytics studies, such as physician segmentations and patients' medication resident studies, and the patients' uh, hospital intervention uh, prevention program studies, and then this is a project one among the, uh, them too. So I work for Kavi Global. So we are basically operating from Chicago area. Uh, so Kavi Global is a data analytics co company and we are offering uh, services to business such as consulting and software and solution services. Okay. This is going to be our agenda of the sessions. Uh, let me separate this entire study into uh, two sections. One is about the background about the healthcare industry. The second part is about the actual the study we have conducted. The background will explain the healthcare industry and the potential data we have in our healthcare industries to analyze it. And what are the necessity behind the fraud based abuse studies in healthcare industries? Of course, many of the industries are conducting this kind of a studies, but what is the importance uh, of this kind of studies in healthcare arena? And the second uh, part of my presentations would be to talk about the projects. What is a project about and how did we uh, nailed out those, uh, the difficulties in the projects, then how, how did we simplify it and present it to the, pair, the business and what kind of uh, uh, results we have derived from the project and what are the response received from the business. This is what the second part of my presentations here. And just a key note, uh, in my presentation, I'll be using few technical words which is related to pharmacy claims, which is the patient, doctor, or physicians, uh, the pharmacy store, or uh, the prescription claims. These are all the uh, keywords related to healthcare. The prescription claims, meaning the claim we are getting, the medication we are getting from the pharmacy stores, or the claim they are processing at insurance company through the pharmacy store. Uh, let me move on to the background of uh, the healthcare industry. Let me keep this co complete conversation as, as interactive as possible. So do you have any idea about these numbers? So let me start with healthcare spent. So we have a dollar 3.35 trillion. So do you know what number is in healthcare industry? Anyone? All right. This is an approximate number of healthcare expenses in 2017. Do you believe that? which is a huge cost related to the healthcare industry. And what is 10K dollar? Any guess? Which is a dollar amount we are spending. So every individual is spending approximately $10,000 for healthcare expenses. So I'm not counting for the premium and means kind of a, the, what kind of a plan I have and what how much the premium I'm going to pay for the plan, I'm not considering that. Only for the expenses related to the medical expenses or the pharmacy claim expenses. And moving on to pharmacies uh, segment. Do you know what is 67,000 represents here? All right. So we have 67,000 pharmacy stores in USA. And each and every pharmacy stores are processing minimum of 700 uh, pharmacy claims in a day. If they're operating for a 10 hours in a particular day, they could able to uh, process 700 claims. Those 700 claims will be paid by the insurance company. And moving on to Rx segment, the prescriptions. 
So we have a four billion prescriptions processed by these uh, 67,000 pharmacy stores uh, annually, actually. And the uh, can you guess what is 11.9, which is 12 percentage of percentage we have mentioned here? Any guess? Uh, no. <laughs> Let me tell that. So 12 percent of the populations in United States, uh, they are consuming minimum of five drugs in a 30 days interval of time. That means if I take randomly a 30 days uh, of time period in my data pool, I could find 12 percent of the populations, they are using minimum of five drugs. Out of which, how many claims are going to be a fraudulent and how many claims going to be a genuine case? We have no clue. And moving on to physicians uh, category, what is 950K? I have here number, any guess? Yes, number of active physicians in United States. So I'm not, when I say active physicians, every year we have a, a federal government called CMS, so Center for Medicare and Medicare Services. They are deactivating few physicians because of their problem activity. So these 950K physicians are actively participating in the prescription, uh, active, uh, prescription plans. That means they are capable to prescribe any uh, drugs in the United States. And any guess on $6.5 billion? I'm sorry? Any guess, no problem. <laughs> uh, not actually. <laughs> so $6.5 billion, each and every, uh, I mean, cumulative of all 950K uh, doctors, they are getting a referral bonus from drug and uh, device manufacturer companies. You know why? If they prescribe uh, their medications, means if a particular for a manufacturer's company I have, and they are paying me some kind of amount, and if I prescribe those, their product, their product to my patients, then I'll be getting a referral bonus. This is about $6.5 billion in an annual, annually we are computing, according to 2014 studies only. So we don't have any recent number, so we will be extracting that soon. Okay, let us see the how prescriptions works. So we are talking about the prescriptions, doctors and patients, how these are working basically. So usually if I, if I look at the eagle view, the patients are visiting a doctor. Doctors are uh, monitoring or checking the patient's medical conditions and they are prescrib prescribing a medicines and the patients walk into the pharmacy store and collecting the medicines. This is what happening. But what actually happening is a background story about that. So as soon as the patient receives the e-prescription from the doctor, means the patient is not allowed to take a prescription from the doctors. So they will be getting e-prescriptions. The patients can mention which pharmacy store I have to receive my prescriptions. So they would tell to doctor that, okay, you send my prescription to this particular uh, pharmacy store. And doctor will be do, uh, doing the same, same activity. And before they walk into pharmacy store, the means patients walk into pharmacy stores, the pharmacy store will be sending those information to insurance company. So in between insurance company and the uh, pharmacy stores, we have a one more layer called PBM, which is pharmacy benefit manager. So those will be adjudicating our claims. That means the validating our claims and they would give a, just, uh, a decision uh, to pharmacy store that how much is a cost the patient has to pay for his medications. Then whether the particular medications belongs to the plan or not, or uh, whether the particular patients can allow to take these medications or not. Those kind of a decision will be shared with the pharmacy stores. And when the patients walk into the pharmacy stores, they could pay their cost. Otherwise, they will get a result saying that your claim has been rejected. So these transactions will take minimum of one to two minutes, sorry, maximum of one to two minutes. Do you believe that? So within that particular time frame, we have to analyze which claims are going to be a suspicious claims for me and which claims are going to be a genuine claim for me, which is hard to take a decision uh, in this particular uh, two minutes uh, tough interval. Now, moving, off, mo moving into a fraud-based abuse uh, study. Out of $3.35 trillion we have mentioned in our, the first slides, the background of healthcare uh, industry, 
three to five percent, three to ten percent of the healthcare spends are related to fraud, waste, and abuse. That means I could expect if I take a, randomly, if I pick any particular uh, data, then that data it's prone to be a three to ten percent of the medical spends. So industries are trying to chase this kind of a dollar amount. How can we make use of that 10% of the fraudulent amount which you're spending unnecessarily, and how can we make use of that amount for the needy people? So this is what the study whole about, uh, the whole study about it. And when we are talking about only the prescription claims, there are only three actors are behind the scenes. So the patients, physicians, and pharmacy. So maybe if I talk about the whole healthcare industry, I could find more actors. So including drug manufacturers or the payer in between or the agents who are uh, asking the patients to take a particular plan, those all will be, will be coming to pictures. But here we are focusing only on prescription claims. So the possible actors when I mention, none of the actors will be committing frauds or they will be involved in the suspicious crime activities alone. So they would be tied with the multiple actors. Let's say the patients will be a friend of a pharmacy store. So for pharmacy store will be uh, processing his more claims through that particular pharmacy store. So the patient alone will not commit fraud here. So along with the pharmacy store, he will be doing a uh, fraud. So it is not advisable to look at the data only for the particular actor. So we have to find out the real transaction behind multiple actors. This is what we are going to look into it in subsequent slides. Okay, before we understand what is a data model we have and we have proposed to our business and how did we implement it? Let's spend some time on current status and challenges. Okay, as I mentioned, how the prescription claims will, uh, the, the life cycle of prescription claims in the previous slides. So this status, the current process will explain how this kind of a check's happening at the back end from the insurance, uh, of insurance company perspective or the uh, pharmacy uh, benefit manager's perspective. Each and every transaction we receive from the pharmacy store, the insurance company will be checking those claims. So those checks are just preliminary check. That means that whether the particular member is eligible to get a claims or uh, whether the particular transaction is genuine. Meaning, if I have taken an opioid drugs for 10 days, which is not genuine because I'm allowed to take only seven days of opioid claims on any particular day. So, I have a set of rules at the insurance company side that if my OPI claims exceed the limit of sin, reject that particular claim. Otherwise, accept that. What if the particular patient submitting three claims at a time uh, in a, on a particular day for a, a subsequent uh, three to four days? That means, let, let's say the four days. So he will be getting 12 claims, which is not genuine. But if I look at the rules perspective, they will be processing the, processing the claims and they won't reject those claims at all. Okay. And the actor level checks are primitive. That means that whenever we are looking into the transaction level details, we are missed to address the potential behind the particular actors who are committing the fraud and activity. Let's say here an example, the OPI case, the patients, patients is an access patient is an actor here, we are processing his claims of OPR claims for four times, though it is gonna look like a genuine claim for me, but who is prescribing those kind of a, a claim for me? And if I summarize it, all the claims at a monthly level, I could able to figure out, okay, in a month this patient has consumed 12 medication, which is not genuine, which is not look like genuine, and we should not, we should not process this data at all. So, that case, we are missing to capture the bigger picture about the transaction level details. And moreover, this kind of a fraudulent activity, when we, when we capture uh, the actor level details, uh, we are, uh, uh, meaning like uh, before that. So the actor level details, we have some kind of a checks at uh, PBM industry side, otherwise insurance company side. So those checks are based on the historical fraudulent activity. So none of the fraudulent activities, uh, uh, fraudlesters are committing the same kind of fraudulent activities on an everyday basis. They will keep on changing the pattern and they will find out a different pattern to commit the fraud, to gain a business, so to gain some kind of a benefit from the business. This is what happened. So this kind of a rule-based systems are based on the historical fraud activity and we should have, we should also change the pattern of identifying those kind of a, uh, data. 
And finally, we have our false positives or expensive. Okay, what is, do you know what is false positive here? Excellent. Okay, so uh, when we are capturing the information based on the actor level, the rule based on the rule based system, and its possibility to uh, reject the genuine uh, claims which are look like a fraudulent activity. The same example of OPI case. The 12 claims, the patient has to take the medications because he has a severe the pain. Uh, maybe the re recently he has uh, gotten into surgery and because of that he has to take some kind of a medication for 12 days, which is genuine. But because of these kind of a rules, they'll be denying those kind of a claims. And we'll be identifying those claims as a fraudulent activity and the investigator has to spend more time and effort to invest, investigate such kind of a data and identify nothing out of it. So we are, not only we are spending more money on this kind of, allowing this kind of fraudulent activities, we are spending more time on investigations too. Moving on to the next slide. The objective of the study is to find out that actors who are committing the fraudulent activity and rank them based on some scoring mechanisms. I will be explaining that in later. So we have to rank them and then extract them for our investigation purpose. This is an entire study's objective. So what do we do, what do, we do here? The entire data sets, we are separating a two, two, kind of, two segmentations. The so first segmentations will explain the behavior level analysis, means how the patients, how the actors are prescribed, uh, are consuming their drugs, and how the pa uh, doctor, uh, doctors are prescribing the pat, uh, drugs to the patients. So this kind of a behavioral study, we are doing that. And second segmentation is related to the relationships. So which doctor is related to what kind of a patients and what kind of a pharmacies are related to the particular uh, doctor. So based on these two um, segmentations, we are deriving a unique score, which is called as anomaly score. That score is going to justify who is pro probably committing a fraud uh, based on the uh, in, uh, healthcare, uh, based on the pharma prescription climbing activity. Okay. Okay, so uh, before I explain the steps, so do you know how much percentage of the time uh, the typical data scientist spends to prepare the data? Any percentage? I'm sorry? Ah, no problem. <laughs> that, that is very closest. So totally we are spending 80% of the times only for the data preparations and only remaining 20% of the times only for the data, actual data model. So here also, data cleaning and data summarization is related to the 80% of the potential the time we are spending for the particular data model. And last three steps are related to the behavior, uh, the scoring mechanism, so how, our, how are we going to create the anomaly score for each and every actors and flag them for the investigations. Okay, the data cleaning process, which is a core part of a healthcare industry, with the help of industry experts, we have done this kind of a cases. So let me give an example. So if a claim is rejecting, I'll be getting two entries. One entry with the positive numbers and second entry with the negative numbers. When I'm, when I'm removing the claims, which are going to be, which were the rejected data, then we have to remove both the records from the data sets, which is genuine, uh, genuine removal. Similarly, if I have any data which is prescriber ID or the uh, uh, pharmacy IDs are null or missing, which is not required for us because that is not going to derive any sense to us in our analysis. So those kind of data uh, steps cleaning process we have done in data cleaning uh, steps. Data summarization is a core part of our data transformation studio and with the help of that uh, we have created a summary to capture the anomalous behavior actors. Okay. So data summary part. To simplify the particular, the slide, what we have done, we are accumulating all the climb level, monthly climb, climb level informations for each and every actors and combination of multiple actors to get this kind of a matrix. That matrix is going to be our input to the model. That means, for example, if I take an example of the patient and pharmacy combination. Total number of doctors involved with this kind of transaction between them means 
patients and pharmacy, how many doctors involved in the transactions? Then what is the cost associated with the transaction? And how many claims they have? Then the drug spend, that means if I uh, separate the drugs based on the category, so the opioid drugs and all will come under the painkiller categories. And similarly, we, if I categorize all the drugs, I could get the drug spread uh, information. So those informations will be our data sets for our model. So here, the summarized sections will explain how many categories we have prepared. And we have totally seven uh, levels of data sets we have prepared to analyze this particular pattern. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are segmenting the entire data set into two levels. So first level are later, is related to anomalous behavior and second level is related to anomalous relationships. So anomalous behavior, uh, if, I, if I look at the eagle view, if I want to find out the behavior of the particular actor, I have to group them into uh, a particular groups. So let's say I have 10,000 records I have. Then I'm creating those 10,000 records into three different buckets. The three different buckets will be my possible uh, groups. If I analyze each and every group separately, I could able to figure out, okay, which groups is different than other groups. So this is what we, have, uh, we are doing here in the first steps, grouping a similar behavior actors in a first step. Then, once we have grouped, can we spend time on investigating each and every groups, which is easy? No, that is going to be a tedious job because I might get in a particular groups, again 10,000 records, if I have overall 50K information in our overall data sets. So 10,000 records, I can't uh, analyze everything, each and every records. So what we can do, the density is a one, will factor, will distinguish what data sets I have to probably look into it and spend time on that analysis. Okay, how density will be helping us to find out anomaly behavior? Any idea? Density means number of records in my particular group. If I have a very less number of records in my particular group, that is going to be my first uh, suspicious uh, level. Right? And finally, we have a distance from the group center. So I have separated my data set into multiple groups and com computer my density of each and every group. And finally, I'm going to calculate the distance between each and every point and the center of the particular groups. How distance is going to explain my anomaly uh, here? Any idea? Any guess? Okay. What if my actor level information, it's in the boundary of my uh, group? That is going to be a differentiator factor with all other actors in my same groups. So, this is what exactly we are going to do in anomalous behavior. We have a web-based application called Advana, and Advana interns employs Spark and machine learning libraries. So with the help of that, we were able to group all the, class, all the actors with the similar behaviors. So when we talk about the clusters, uh, we are using here k-mean cluster model, uh, algorithm. And when we are doing a k-mean clusters, one of the important factor we should understand is that what is the optimal number of k I have to consider to group my actual level data, which is primary objective for me in my k-mean clusters. So here, what I have to do is that I have to follow the elbow methodology. That would explain how did I arrive the optimal number of k value. So with the help of the k values, I could group them into multiple uh, groups based on their behaviors. And this is how we have derived the anomaly score. So basically, anomaly score consists of two sections, density factors and distance factors. So density factors going to explain which group of uh, information is going to be a, a distinguished factor for rest of the groups. So how are we going to compute? The size of the clusters, let's say in my groups, I have a 10 populations. And overall data set, let's say I have a 10,000 uh, records I have. So 10 divided by 10,000 will be my density factor here. And distance factor here, nothing but, if I have a particular record set, let's say they are in 50 uh, as a equivalent distance, and maximum distance among all the, uh, all the actors in the same groups, let's say I have uh, 
10,000. Then 50 divided by 10,000 will be my distance factor for particular actor. If the particular actor value is more or less, that would justify my anomaly score or uh, genuine claims actors. And based on these two scores, what I can do, I'll take a maximum of these two scores. That would be the unique factor to get a unique score for the particular actors. Then later on, I have to summarize at actor level, right? That means here the calculation will be at individual as well as the combination of multiple actors. So from that I have to extract only the particular actor level summary. What I have to do? I have multiple data sets with the scoring uh, card in it and then summarize it with pro putting proper weightage on each groups. That would lead a unique score which is actor level score for us. So that's our computations about the anomaly score behavior scores and let's move on. This is an example we'll explain how did we arrive the in score for each and every patient. So the group one, group two, group four, and group three and group four explains what are the levels of data we have computed, the anomaly behavior scores, and how did we, how did we get the final anomaly score for each and every actors. So that is going to be ranked based on putting all the records in a descending order, then we will be extracting for the investigation. Let's move on to the anomalous relationships. So anomalous relationship in a nutshell, if I want to explain, this is, uh, we have done based on the, the count of, of digit, to total number of actors in neighborhood of each and every uh, actors. So if I want to explain that graphically, so we could plot all the records, actors information and the relationship between them in a graphical manner and each and every vertex will represent the particular actor. So here, the green will represent the physician and how many, physi the physician, how many they have the potential, the patient's connections uh, in their prescription. And each and every uh, pharmacy stores, sorry, every patient's how many potential connection with the pharmacy store. So this I'm separating as three level uh, neighborhood summary. The first level, it's immediate uh, vertex, uh, immediate uh, actors for the particular actors we are looking into it. In, in this case, I have a physician. And second level neighborhood, nothing but my first level neighbors of neighbor. So if I have, let's say for simplicity, I have a node one, node two, and node three. If I take all the nodes are related to the first node are going to be my level one neighbors. And all the nodes are connected with level two nodes are going to be my second level neighbors. Similarly for third level neighbors would be my, uh, what the nodes which are connected with the third level uh, nodes here. Means node, I, if I say here, each and every uh, color coding is not going to be a node in graphical uh, t terminology. Then anomaly scores. So now we have constructed a graph. So what else we can do? Now I have the numbers for each and every vertex. Let me bring all the information to the single node. That means I'm collecting all the information to the parent node, which is a patient level or doctor level or pharmacy level. Then once we have all these numbers, assign a weightage on each and every uh, groups based on the numbers I have arrived in each and every levels. That is a one more mechanism. How did we arrive that? That is basically a, a statistical computation we have done. Uh, let me explain in Q&A session if you want, if you're interested to learn about that. And if I, once I have assigned all the weightage to each and every level, then take out the maximum count of each and every uh, level. That is going to be my anomaly score based on anomalous relationships uh, concept or segmented. Once I have these two scores, anomalous behavior scores and anomalous relationship scores combined together, that is going to be my consultant score for the particular actor. So this rank or this course will be ranked based on the descending order and then topmost uh, rank actors will be considered a suspicious activity and we have to investigate those sections, uh, those record data alone and further and find out whether they are going to be a fraudulent activity, a fraudulent behaviors uh, transactions or uh, genuine claims transactions. Okay, the, this is goes to implementation side. How did we implement at this uh, particular uh, sections? We have a web-based application. That application has a capability to receive the claims. That means we will be, user has to upload the claims uh, into the system and they could run the model. And the model in terms will compute these two uh, scores and cumulatively compute one unique score for each and every actor. And that score 
will be viewed by the, the user who is executing that. That user will be send this information to the investigator. Investigator spend, some, uh, spend time on the investigation, actual investigations means analyzing all the claim informations and then they will tag whether that transaction is going to be a genuine or the fraudulent. That feedback again will feed into the system that will work as a machine learning algorithm and prior knowledge. That would be a one more additional input when I'm running the second times uh, the same model. So that means based on anomalous behavior and based on anomalous relationships, I'll be computing score. On top of it, this feedback will add weightage to the model. The initial results or the inferences we have derived. Uh, the inferences we have derived from the models are fabulous. And uh, most of the cases, the rule-based systems is fail to capture the scenario which we have captured through the model. And moreover, the false positive, that means the genuine claims were not, uh, were not tagged as a false claims, of, uh, a fraudulent claims transaction, so that we saved investigator time and effort. And also, we have to respect their time and effort. So, and ranking weightage. From the model exercise, we have learned that the ranking we are assigning in each and every groups, either through the anomalous behavior or anomalous relationships, we have to adjust so that that would lead uh, better predictions, otherwise uh, it would mislead some information. So with help of industry expert knowledge, we have to provide the weightage always. As the next steps, we are trying to implement the feedback system we receive from the investigator into the model and incorporate some additional uh, level of information such as social media information such as Twitter and Facebook and then Zillow information to get uh, geographic information. Do you know why do we need uh, Zillow information or geographic information? Any idea? Right, so what if a patient and doctor distance is 5,000 miles? That is going to be add a value in our analysis. So that is why we are planning to incorporate this kind of an information in our model to get, get a better efficiency and better prediction uh, levels. Now let me move on to q and A. I'm open for any questions. Yes. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm never able to hear you. Uh, okay, this false negative. So uh, let me focus on the false positive here, side here. So the ranking will justify uh, the score, uh, the anomaly score will justify that whether the particular actor is going to be a fraudulent or not fraudulent. So the false, uh, the positive meaning I am not flogging, uh, flagging suspicious, uh, sorry, genuine claim as fraudulent claims here at all. So by investigating such kind of a data, we could come to know whether that is going to be a genuine or not. Did I answer your questions? Uh, not quite. I can ask. Yeah. Ah, okay. Do you have an accuracy count? So, for example, if you gave hundred uh, identify, if if you have given hundred more sus most suspicious claims to the investigator, mm -hmm. do you know how many of those were true positives? Uh, I don't have exact statistics, but uh, we used to process uh, minimum of, I think, 10 million informations we have extracted. We have encountered uh, exactly. But I, I'm talking we, about the uh, accuracy that was returned by the investigator because that would speak about how accurate your approach was. Okay, after the investigation, you're talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so after the investigation, approximately. Uh, so I could guess that approximation one. So two to three percent of the claims were flagged as false positive. That means, though we haven't captured much genuine claim as fraudulent, but we have few. Yeah. So what was the lift based on the rule-based model to the uh, unsupervised model that you? So rule-based model uh, that would randomly pick whichever the claims are. Uh, the potentially high. Let's say if I have a uh, hundred claims, a rule-based model will capture the hundred claims look suspicious when compared to other uh, uh, claim, uh, uh, other actors' claims. But in our model, we'll not uh, do that. So because of the uh, anomaly score, that will di distinguish the behavior between the hundred claims uh, actors and less than hundred claims actors. 
And did you train? Uh, did you try different approaches other than k-means uh, and? Uh, yes, we have appro we have done uh, DB scan algorithm, but the uh, drawback behind DB scan algorithm is that uh, we have to provide two parameters, which is PPS and then uh, total number of samples in my uh, clusters, which is we cannot predict in any, uh, any way. So EPS will justify the what is the radius of my data should be, and the sample will explain that what is a minimum sample I should be considered as anomalous behavior, which we should not uh, touch at all because any time I could get any number of uh, numbers which is not going to help us to end up with a true fraudulent uh, category. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Do you still have a minute? I'm sorry? Do you still have a minute? A quick question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Right, so I was curious. Uh, first of all, fascinating work, thank you. Uh, so, is there any intention of making this a real-time system? Or maybe I missed that. I'm sorry, I didn't get you. Is there any intention of making this a real-time system? Uh, this is an intentional an ongoing project. Okay. And uh, we have successfully implemented this concept with uh, our business. And uh, business are using our model. And we are, as a next step, I have, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. we have few uh, potential uh, uh, implementations ongoing on. And uh, that would surely improve the efficiency of the model. And have you noticed any cluster drifting over time? The reason I ask is this, right? When you mentioned that, especially the rules-based system, right, is that people's behaviors change and right. become more innovative. So have you been able to run historical data to see if your initial clusters drifted and predict, you know, and, and could essentially say that, hey, this is how people's behavior changed? Have you been able to see that? Uh, yes, we do so. Uh, and the business are uh, giving a potential input uh, to fine tune the model and uh, the initial results when we share with them and uh, they have uh, spent some time on investigations and the how many false positive and false negative we are receiving and uh, that is going to be our first phase of our analysis. The second phase we, are, we have communicated that we are going to implement these additional features and that is going to improve the efficiency of the model. Very cool. Thank you. Okay.